Good afternoon. This is the Bob Unger Show. And uh, I have a great honor today to speak with a very unusual man, unfortunately unusual. I wish he was more usual. But in today's times, uh, you know, it's like Diogenes when uh, they asked him why he was going around with a candle. And he said, I'm looking for an honest man. Today it might be, um, I'm looking for a thinking man who has principles based on eternal principles. That's now highly unusual. I don't have my candle, but I do have some light bulbs. That's about it. So Rabbi Yitzhak, Yitz, Yitzhak David Smith, um, tell us a little bit about your background, first of all, education, uh, various uh, licenses, ordinations you have, et cetera, et cetera. Well, thanks for being here. And I just want to mention, as I said in my original letter of April, the, August the 30th, you know, today the only credentials that matter are honesty and common sense. And any person can and should really do, um, look at the numbers themselves, look at the evidence themselves, look at what's being said themselves. And so while we could talk about credentials, and I'm happy to talk about my background, at the same time, I, I really try to want to make, I really want to make sure that everyone who's listening understands that they are equally qualified to make decisions and make determinations for themselves. And uh, even if they don't know, at the end of the day, if they can't make sense of something, they're still entitled to make a decision. They are not required to follow other people's uh, guidance or instructions, no matter how credentialed they are or trust other people as being the ones that know because the people that have all the credentials um, may be making a mistake has happened many, many times in human history. So this would not be in any way uh, the first time that highly, highly credentialed people have just really missed the boat. Missed Some the people call that the tyranny of the experts. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, the, cult, the cult of expertise. That's, that's really uh, what it is. You, you have to have a degree. It's like in a cult, you know, uh, you have to have a degree, higher levels of degrees. You can't speak about something that you're not degreed in. And, um, and then you're not allowed to, to speak about uh, up against or in contradiction to anyone who has a higher degree than you. So these, right. these are all myths, myths of our time. So um, all that being said, I happen to be fortunate enough to um, be in a conjunction of background that really um, is able to open my eyes to what's going on over here. And number one is I studied at the University of California, Berkeley, studied molecular biology. Um, I also studied in and did uh, cancer research and studied in the whole area of uh, infectious diseases, virology. And I then went on to study the philosophy of biology, seeing that a person's um, understanding, their viewpoint of the biology that they're seeing is 100% based on their philosophy of biology. How do they look at the world? Do they think the world has a spiritual component to it? Do they think that there's anything in life beyond the physical and chemical components? That will change the way they understand biology. It will, ch it will determine what they accept as evidence and what they discard as evidence. Um, and so that, that was my background there. Then I, I saw that uh, based on the people that I was working with, that their, um, their forthrightness, their courage to speak the truth was met with uh, a tremendous campaign to remove their funding, to remove their graduate students, to remove their laboratories and so forth when they did not um, support the National Institutes of Health um, ideas of what was the only things that a person could be examining. Even though they were, these scientists that I was working for, including Harry Rubin, um, who was one of the, the ones who created the paradigm, the modern paradigm, when he decided then changed his mind that he wasn't going to support that anymore and he realized he had been wrong, um, he was basically silenced and marginalized. So I saw that, you know, I really needed to, if I was going to be interested in, in uh, being honest and uh, pursuing the truth, I needed to have a field that was going to be independent of this type of regulation and group speak and group think and so forth. And, and one of the few remaining professions in that regard is the uh, profession of law. Although in law school, they definitely try to conform your thinking um, very, very much so. That's a separate discussion. Um, and then I also became a rabbi, when I ordained as an Orthodox rabbi. And- um, Which served, yeshiva did you uh, get your ordination from? Uh, yeshiva is Tomchei Tzvim in Lubavitch in 770. Eastern ah, Korea. okay, okay. 
that really makes you unusual because uh, I've gone to a lot of uh, Lubavitch shuls and, and also some Satmar and various other uh, iterations. I have found that the rabbis who are supposed to be teachers, I have found most of them afraid to discuss things that are politically incorrect, even though the Torah speaks directly to each of these things. You know, that, that's sadly um, often you could, you know, see that. I think that everyone has their safe zones and what they're willing to come face to face with. And um, it, it's unfortunate. People won't speak about certain issues. Certain issues people could speak about as much as they want or they kind of allow themselves that to speak about certain political issues and other issues they won't talk about it. They won't even touch it. And a lot of that's driven by fears of how other people are going to perceive them. Uh, fears of what the congregation might say or people that they're trying to attract to their programs are going to say, are going to say. And the, my, I always try to encourage them. No, that's, that's not the measure. The measure is speaking the truth and speaking it openly. Now people might decide that because of that, they're not going to come to your synagogue, but they will still at least have a benchmark. They will still have a placeholder in their world where they know the truth is. And that's, that's so uh, key. And what people don't realize, you know, there's a, I just speak about Lubavitch as an example. Today, everyone, the Lubavitch Rebbe has received such a sort of acceptance in um, society and, and people, you know, everyone sort of speaks, speaks respectfully of him. But there were many positions that Rebbe took that were very much opposed at the time when he made them, both by the establishment and by people even within Chabad. And uh, I was just on a call yesterday, uh, on Sunday actually with a lawyer who was saying that when there was a court decision uh, against religious freedoms, uh, the Rebbe wrote, he was the only person that wrote saying that the Supreme Court decision was wrong and it needed to be uh, overturned. And he, this person is a secular lawyer at the time, he later on became religious, but when he saw the Rebbe wrote that, he's like, who is this rabbi who has this, you know, out of the box opinion going against the American Jewish Congress and the reform and the conservative, all these organizations and is willing to say that the United States Supreme Court is wrong, this decision is wrong. And, but what that points out is that the Rebbe's vision was to speak the truth and to speak up for America, regardless of what other people thought about. What's happened today is that the, the Rebbe has reached this sort of cultural popularity and cultural acceptance, and no one wants to disturb that. No one wants to be a controversial and bring to the forefront the Rebbe's real positions on many different issues and the degree to which he sought that his, those that um, were inspired by the truth that he was speaking, the degree to which he, thought he um, sought for them to speak that truth and come out and, and say that clearly to be a beacon into the world. That, that's been uh, somewhat muted, unfortunately. And that's a tragedy for, for not only the people that are charged with that responsibility, but it's a, tra a tragedy for the world because the world is missing the message. And the message is a message of truth. It's a message of hope. And it's a message of clear thinking that will re redeem the confused people from their confusion, which is going to only bring goodness for them too. Well, ironically, the Rebbe, in his, one of his books, I don't know if he wrote it with his own hand or what one of his aides actually wrote the book, but certainly it was taken from his teachings. Uh, in his book about Israel, he talked about the fact that you cannot even discuss giving away the land, let alone give it away. It is improper and immoral and against Torah to even have a discussion considering the subject. And yet, of course, you have this so-called, I call it the rest in peace deal, uh, where they want to create a Palestinian state with its capital in Yerushalayim. And uh, people who are supposedly on the right side, you know, defend it and make excuses for it. Uh, and this happens all the time. People, instead of being umpires in a baseball game, they become cheerleaders for a cause. And if their particular favorite uh, celebrity politician is the one doing it, it's okay. And if the other side does it, the exact same thing, 
It's not okay. It's this kind of double standard. And uh, I don't see too many people today who have only one set of standards for everything, which is really what Torah is. Well, you know, this example of what you're saying with the land of Israel is something that's a perfect example. I was once, I spent Shabbos in a Chabad house and the rabbi, who was a friend of mine, he said, uh, wouldn't you kindly share some words of Torah with the congregation after the Torah reading on the, on the uh, Sabbath day, the Shabbos day. And so I did, and I got up and I actually spoke about exactly this subject that at that point there was some um, issue with Israel surren uh, surrendering land uh, to terrorism. And uh, I spoke exactly what the Rebbe said about this is not permissible even to discuss it. In the middle of while I was speaking, one of the congregants was very, very upset by what I said and um, actually left the synagogue in the middle of while I was speaking. And um, that wasn't so surprising. I mean, it was surprising because he was hearing it from what the Rebbe was saying from me for the first time, even though he was coming to a Chabad house on a weekly basis. So that was surprising that this was news to him that the Lubavitch Rebbe taught this way. But also um, afterwards, my, my dear friend who works day and night to help the Jewish people and he, and he helps the non-Jewish people in the town that he's in and, and he's a tremendous, tremendous inspiration. At the same time, he was just so devastated and he was beside himself with the, the fact that this person walked out of the synagogue and he, was, he didn't know what to do with himself with the fact that he had asked me to speak about this very important issue or asked me to speak. I don't know that he wanted me to speak about this very important issue, but I had. And um, it put him into a tremendous personal place of conflict between these kind of mixed goals of wanting to attract as many people as possible. At the same time, he knows that what I was saying was true. And so this is, this is one of the challenges that we face um, and, and every time, but it's really the job of a, of a religious leader the, in the smicha, the um, rabbinical ordination says that this person is fit to be a mayor hero, which means to be a person who's able to guide and provide direction for the people in a way of pointing in the right direction toward, towards connection with God Almighty. And that's what, um, that's what we all have to reground ourselves in. That it's not about, it's not a popularity contest. It's not about ensuring a certain membership in a congregation. It's not about um, getting a certain amount of donations. And, and it's, I, I, obviously everyone has to, um, these, these rabbis, live based on the salaries that they're able to make based on the congregation and so forth, because they don't get any money from any central office. So I was, you know, that's very vitally important for them. They need to feed their families to make this an, an ongoing, a going concern that can serve the community. But at the same time, it's, it's, we can't allow the essential clarity of the issues of our day be lost because of these other very important factors, which is you do want to have as many people coming as possible. But I think it's necessary to really get back to the basics and say, okay, one second, we need to educate everyone in our generation of what it means to live in a way that's not afraid of anything in the world other than God Almighty. And when I say fear, I mean fear as in seeing God's vision in awe. When we see God's great vision for all of humanity, what that really looks like and how God is, has faith in every single human being to reach their potential, that's such an inspiring message. We cannot compromise on that. We cannot compromise that and say, you know what? We're going to tone down the message to try to attract more people. Then they're not getting the full message. They're not getting the real full message that's going to accelerate their lives into a place of positivity and prosperity. And that's something that applies to the Jews and the non-Jews. The non-Jews are also needing to hear the message of truth. And that comes from the Torah. So it's, it's a dilemma that every rabbi faces. But I always encourage my colleagues is that go with the truth of the message. Explain it lovingly. And, and help guide the person to see that there is some greater truth here. That, like you said at the beginning, is an, etern an eternal truth that is meant to guide humanity in all times and all situations. The fear of God is the beginning of all wisdom. So let's segue from there into all these rabbis, priests, ministers, what have you, who are totally caving in like a cheap beach chair to the diktats of the, of the state telling them that they can't have a minion, they can't pray, they can't daven, and they have to wear masks and all of these things, which, as you know, I, I'm a lawyer as well, but don't hold it against me. 
Uh, these are in, in the Declaration of Independence, and they constitute unalienable rights that inhere in you as a human being created by God, and yet they all conform. I haven't seen one other than you and Michal Green. I'm sure there are others who are standing up against this. Well, there definitely are others standing up against that. I think it's really important to emphasize that they understand that their role as spiritual leaders is to be exactly that, spiritual leaders, and they are not meant to abdicate their role to place a public health official or public health doctor as the spiritual or new uh, religion head. That's not what's meant to be. And it's, uh, there are, so there's plenty of people that recognize that. When I say plenty, I would like there to be more, but what I'm saying is I could definitely point to examples of, of rabbis and Rosh Yeshivas who have kept their yeshivas open, have kept their synagogues open under tremendous, uh, sometimes under tremendous pressures. Uh, I spoke to the son of one rabbi uh, from the time of Passover until when I spoke to him, which is about two months ago, their synagogue had been visited by the police 30 times in an attempt by the police to try to close down the synagogue. And we have to remember that, first of all, all these decrees are entirely voluntary. Everyone who's shutting down is shutting it down voluntarily, uh, often on personal phone calls from the mayor or the governor uh, or their representatives, uh, asking them to please cooperate um, voluntarily based on doctors calling them up and pr pr a pressure from doctors and donors. The, the key point here is that um, I believe that you're talking about this concept of folding, that people are folding. This folding did not suddenly happen on March 24th. This folding has been um, developing and the groundwork for it has been laid over the last few decades in which spiritual leaders have bought into an idea that their spiritual leadership is really limited and they, since they're not experts in certain, circum certain areas, um, that therefore they're not authorized to speak on those, those areas. So you see that, for example, uh, in the area of marital issues, you see rabbis, Orthodox rabbis, sending their congregants to uh, therapists yeah. who are taught not to talk about God. So it, how does it make sense for a person who's spiritually trained um, and on paper believes that the Torah has the answers, God's message to all humanity, how does it make sense for a person like that to then send people who are coming to him for spiritual guidance and for, to shed light into the most spiritual interaction that we have in our lives is with our spouse. How does it possibly make sense for that person to send these wonderful congregants who are seeking guidance in life and seeking divine guidance to send them to a psychiatrist or a psychologist who is trained to take God into the picture? That shows you there's something severe, that, that folding, that collapse has already happened in that rabbi's mind and in the mind of the congregant who's, who's willing to follow along. Because I, I want to point out something to you here. We can say, well, it's too bad that the rabbis shut down their congregations and it's not right that they should follow these uh, voluntary suggestions or decrees or whatever it is of the public health warfare. But the congregants are equally responsible and sometimes even more responsible because in certain cases, the congregants campaigned to their rabbis to close the synagogues. And the congregants, even those that saw that it was the wrong thing to do, they continued to follow the rabbis, even when they knew the rabbis were doing something that was against the instructions of the Torah, which is that you always get together in congregation to pray. Humanity is meant to gather together and to praise God and express our gratitude and pray on behalf of the world. So the congregants are equally responsible for this. this it's, a, it's a mutual folding well, of the, the rabbi and the congregation. One of the guys that brought the uh, lawsuit, which I do not like at all, uh, is a Lubavitch guy, and he's a lawyer, and I believe he's also a rabbi. And the minute I saw this lawsuit, I thought, oh, this is dangerous, because they brought that lawsuit against the uh, church closures and synagogue closures on the basis of unequal treatment. That's like saying, oh, it's okay to put the Jews in Auschwitz if we also put the Gentiles in Auschwitz. So that makes it kosher. And so they were claiming, not that people have an unalienable right to go to church or go to synagogue. 
They were claiming it's okay if you abuse everyone's rights equally. And everybody extolled this decision as if it was, uh, you know, coming from God. And I think it's a very dangerous decision. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I don't know which particular decision you're referring to. If you're referring no, to the, the, one, the one just now that... Uh, oh, the Supreme Court decision. Well, I wrote an entire um, analysis of that saying exactly what you're saying. It's, it's extremely dangerous. And not only that, the Supreme Court upheld the power of the public health officials to make these decrees as long as they're equal. But equally disturbing was the fact that the plaintiffs in that case, both the Ar Ar Roman Catholic Diocese and the um, Aguda, Aguda. Israel, um, which is not a Lubavitch organization, but still no. um, they, they're making this, the same mistake you're referring to, is that they only attacked it on the equal protection grounds and they did not attack it on First Amendment grounds that this is beyond the scope of government to be able to regulate religious activity and gatherings. And in fact, the, these plaintiffs did not challenge the 50% um, limitations in the yellow zone, and they did not challenge the governor's ability to make these decrees at all. They did not challenge the, whether there's a pandemic that warrants this. They did not challenge the red, yellow, uh, red, orange, yellow distinctions of, uh, you know, this ability to grade zones of people, and they did not challenge the essential, non-essential distinctions. That I think is a, it's a terrible failing of the plaintiffs. And it goes exactly to what I was saying before. And a moment ago, I said that it's, it's equally the rabbis and the congregants that are equally responsible. Here, the, the sort of the priests of the temple of co the court are being told, uh, making a decision, which is, is unfortunately taking us away from the constitution. But in addition, the people, the congregants who are coming to say to the priests, uh, here, rule for us, they themselves are, are acknowledging 99% of the power of tyranny and only quibbling over a very small amount. And then when the court gives them that tiny little, um, that tiny little uh, relief, they're celebrating it as if it's a major victory for religious freedoms. It's totally pulling the wool over the eyes of the people. Well, it's, it's ironic that this is a Nazi concept. Everybody is an essential person. Anyone created by God, which is all of us, we are essential people in more ways than one. We're essential to God. We're essential to our families and our loved ones and our friends and our community. Uh, so this labeling of people, and, and nobody even has a red flag that comes up when they hear this term, essential. This is exactly what the Nazis did. Well, it's exactly what the Nazis did, and, and people don't uh, like to hear that because they like to imagine that someone can make these essential, non-essential distinctions and not be thinking like a Nazi. But they don't understand that only a Nazi thinks about essential, non-essential distinctions. And they've completely, these people that are, are going along with this and allowing this to stand are, I believe, contributing to the problem by making it seem like it's normal and not a Nazi thing. The, the reality is, like, just like you said, the lives unworthy of life was a Nazi distinction, and they got to decide who fits into that, who doesn't fit into that. And, and the total dishonesty of people to say it's okay, essential, non-essential is okay, is, is really a, a terrible, terrible lack. It shows a, a spiritual um, collapse. That's what's really underlying this physical collapse. It's a spiritual collapse that's gone on for decades, where people are willing to accept less and less um, as, you know, as a small you know, a uh, very tiny bone of uh, some sort of little bit of relief from this. And they're not willing to challenge at its core. And I believe that fundamentally at that, why they don't challenge it is for two reasons. One is that morally they're lacking the, the internal backbone to be able to see what's really happening and to be willing to speak up against it. That's from a moral perspective. And second of all, because they're, they're, you know, putting, um, looking like they, they belong and looking like they're somehow, uh, you know, friendly with the governors and friendly with all their people in these offices. Uh, they don't want to challenge their, their ultimate authority. And it's, it's tragic. I was in uh, Borough Park with uh, Heshi Tischler and I, I stood out like a sore thumb. I was the only guy now wearing a fur hat. <laughs> and, and the uh, chief of police of Brooklyn comes over to me and spoke in a very nasty uh, manner, extremely unprofessional. And uh, he said to me that I'm going to be arrested. 
because when he told me uh, to wear a mask, I said, I don't want to wear a mask and I'm not going to wear a mask. And he says to me, well, you're going to be arrested. And I said, really? Uh, under what basis am I going to be arrested? And he said, well, Governor Cuomo said, and I became like Steve Martin, the comedian. I don't know if you're familiar with him. He used to go, well, excuse me, Governor Cuomo, huh? Now that's coming from Mount Sinai. So it, it's amazing how, I don't know what it is about Jews, but it seems to me that Jews are very prone, most, of course, not all, to always kneel to authority. And I think that they confuse God with so-called secular or state authorities, and they don't know the difference because they bow their heads more to that state authority than they do to Hashem. So, you know, I think that it's a, it's a complex situation and uh, there's some truth to what you're saying, but there's also some non-truth to what you're saying. And I'll tell you why, because the fact of the matter is the whole spirit of liberty that underlies the um, United States of America comes from the Torah and comes from the Jewish examples uh, in history of standing up against tyranny. So there is always been a Jewish um, attitude of standing up against tyranny, no matter how powerful the king was, starting with Abraham, the first Jew, um, stood up against Nimrod, who sought to rule the world. Moses stood up against Paro, um, and, and it goes on from generation to generation. We're coming up to Hanukkah now, the Maccabees stood up against the Greeks, um, the Jews that stood up against the Romans, and it goes on through history, and there are many, many great stories of, of Jewish people who gave up their lives and refused to bow to the authority of the times and, and literally were, were killed either by uh, burning or by being you know, killed in the Inquisition or killed in the Holocaust um, for being Jewish and, and not willing to, to uh, compromise. And, and so, who are the first people that the Maccabees killed? Go ahead, tell me. Deformed Jews. Oh, well, you know, the, the, that, let's get that in a second. So the, the, the point is that there have been Jews that are, have been willing to stand up against tyranny in all times. And the challenge is, I think that there's, there's two problems here. One is a spiritual, when there's a spiritual sense of compromise, a spiritual willingness to give in and compromise um, that then weakens a person to be able to stand up in future times. And also there are people that are, like the CDC says openly, that they have rabbis and like they do in every cultural community, every religious community who are going to be delivering the message, the trusting message of what needs to be done next to advance the public health agenda. People are not aware of that. And the reason they're not aware of that is because they don't read the Centers for Disease Control information. They don't read the World Health Organization information. If people read that and understood what it would mean, they would realize that there is, uh, there are people that are, they're trusting, just like in, in uh, Germany and in the countries that Germany invaded, the Jewish people were led um, to believe by a combination of German misinformation uh, Nazi information, the, the, the Gestapo and the SS and so forth, they came in with specific disinformation that Jewish people were going to go to better places. And it was also in conjunction with Jews who were um, co-opted by the Juden, Nazi. Juden rats. Exactly. To telling the Jews that um, they should go along with this because it's for their own benefit. So I don't think that's a so much a reflection on the Jewish people who were led, literally led to the slaughter. I think that they... Um, th that the trusting um, people that you presume to be good and following their leadership is, is, a, is a positive trait. You know, we always look like, we say, the sheep. Well, the sheep is both can be taken as a negative and can be taken as a positive. And, and we, the Jewish people are, are God's flock. And God does want us to listen to people that are spiritual leaders. But you always have to ask yourself the question, is my spiritual leader on track over here, is he grounded in reality? Does he know what he is talking about? That, that there's no presumption from situation to situation that there is going to be, are you gonna give credibility to the same spiritual leader if we see that he's refusing to look into the facts himself, if he's following the guidance from organization that has said that its primary 
claim to pride and, and, and uh, objective is reducing the growth of the world's population, um, then that rabbi is following somebody that is um, an organization and a, and a philosophy that is against the Torah. It's against God. So it's the job of the congregant to really check in and say, am I following someone who's qualified to be a spiritual leader in this situation? So that's why I want to say that in, in response to your question is that we do see examples where the, the Jewish people have stood up and that's an inspiration to the entire world. We do see, see examples where the Jewish people uh, perhaps did not question the people who were telling them what to do enough. And our job is really to recognize that inherent in the, in the possibility of every Jewish person is that spark of godliness that is able to wake up and do what's right and to say, no, I will not go down this path, Mr. Uh, head of the World Health Organization, Centers for Disease Control, Mr. President, Mr. Governor, Mr. R you know, Rabbi, so-and-so, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I realize you've thought about this, but I'm not going down this. And that's, that's the stubbornness. The Jewish people are also called Am Kshay the stubborn, the stubborn uh, stiff-necked people. Stiff-necked people, and, yeah. Right, and that that could be a negative thing. We we you know the Jewish people did some things that uh, rebellious against God in the desert. On this, at the same time, that stubbornness can be a, a positive thing. We persevere, persevere in every generation stubbornly, while the rest of the world might be losing connection with God. And we also could be very stubborn when someone's trying to convince us to do something that they say is in our own benefit, when our inner sense of truth is telling us. This is not for our benefit, even if we don't even can't, we don't have to be scientists to know that. We don't have to be great scientists. You see, we have to be honest and have common sense with what is God saying to us inside. And that message is, don't go down this road. Do not cooperate with this tyranny. Then that's the, always the right answer. What are some of the things that you would say uh, most in our audience might not know about COVID and this whole uh, situation? Well, I don't know what the audience knows and doesn't know, but I think that the, the key is to look at the highest level and see how this is being used as part of a, a revolution, a communist revolution against the United States of America and against the world um, that is being used to destroy people's lives. And while whether or not coronavirus and how dangerous it is and so forth is a non-issue in comparison to the fact that over the 100, last 100 years, 500 million human beings have been murdered and eliminated by these type of governments, the, the Chinese communist government, the, the Marxist government in Russia, in, in Cuba, and in North Korea, Vietnam, we go through all the countries in the world where they have used the excuse of shortage and the Nazis have used, which is part of the communist national socialism is, is socialism just like the uh, international socialists of Russia. Absolutely. And uh, they, they're, they're using the fear of shortage, the fear of crisis, the fear of danger to manipulate the people. And don't forget that the Nazi government, uh, the Nazis had a German phrase, which I um, just, I, I don't, can't quote it, but it was, it, this is for your safety. <laughs> Everything was imposed upon the people, the non-Jewish Germans and the Jewish Germans with the uh, reassurance from the police officers that this is for your safety. And this is how uh, communism works. It's because it is for your safety, because it is. They, they, they don't lie. When they tell you it is for your safety, it really is because they've decided what is safe for you and what's not safe for you. And they're really sincerely doing it for your safety because it's dangerous for you to think independently. It's dangerous for you to step outside the direction they want the entire population to go. And it's for your safety to comply because otherwise they will force you to comply or they will cut off your ability to live by imprisoning you or cut off your food access or, or your job access and so forth. So it really is for your safety. They, it be, the, this is what we have to wake people up to realize that this is what coronavirus is really an excuse for. Now, in addition, I'm sure everyone knows all the details of coronavirus and whether it's actually been isolated and whether it's a new virus and whether the PCR test works and how many false positives there are and whether the PCR test can be used for that and the, all, why people are really dying in the hospital and how everyone in the hospital who has coronavirus is called a coronavirus a patient, even if they're there for labor and delivery, all the methods and means to make this into the terror of our times. But the terror of our times is a tool. It's a tool to enhance and bring to bear the, the tyranny that has already been laid. By the way, just like the collapse of these people has happened over decades of preparing the collapse, the, the framework for tyranny has been built over 
um, decades of laying in place the um, Centers for Disease Control, the public health departments, this attitude of police officers have to uh, uphold the law no matter what the law is. That's a, a new religion that is not constitutional, uh, that did not exist 100 years ago. First obligation of a law enforcement officer was to uphold the Constitution and protect the rights of the people from those that would take it away. And every sheriff and every police officer understood that. He stops the robber because the robbers are interfering with the person's life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. And that's not because it's a law in the law book, because it's a statute. It's, it's, it's something that's interfering with people's rights. And if we don't stop the murderer or stop the robber, we are going to contribute to a a, a situation where we can are no longer the state is no longer protecting people's rights, which is which is uh, to ensure their their rights. That's what it says in the Declaration of Independence. So, um, but the state doesn't grant any rights. The Constitution does not grant any rights. The Declaration of Independence does not grant any rights. The Bill of Rights does not grant any rights. And the problem is, people don't read those documents anymore. They 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 fall can't over. read those documents. They went to school. They can't read. Right. Well, that's right. They've been told how to take the, what these things mean. And it's like I took constitutional law class and they tell you they spend a whole year taking away your common sense to replace it with Supreme Court jurisprudence, which basically tells you that this Constitution and the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence do not mean what they say. They mean what the judges say it means. Well, that is most people can't survive that year of um, having their common sense turned off and replaced with what the professors and the, the establishment of constitutional law would like you to think it means. So this is what we need to know about coronavirus. And everyone can find today online plenty of information and plenty of people that are pointing out. And I think the majority of doctors in the world, the majority of scientists of the world, who do not receive their money from the National Institutes of Health or the Centers of Disease Control, or did not work for the people who were not trained by the people that run the National Institutes of Health, that are not, uh, the vast majority of doctors that are independent thinkers, meaning to say they don't base their decisions based on what they get on the fax machine or the email um, notifications and bulletins from the Centers for Disease Control, the local public health department, or the AMA, or the Institution uh, Infectious Disease uh, uh, the Doctors Association. Those that think independently are, I believe, the majority of them are, are holding with a position that this whole coronavirus situation is completely blown out of proportion. And even to the extent that coronavirus is dangerous or harmful, there are plenty of uh, drugs uh, like hydroxychloroquine uh, and vermectin was uh, being discussed yesterday, um, that these could keep people from dying. And the, that means even the doctors that say that it's dangerous and feel that people are dying of coronavirus and it's, you know, don't focus so much on the, the falsification of the numbers, but they themselves are saying that there's no reason for this to be happening. It could be solved very easily by pre-existing, uh, very inexpensive drugs. So there's enough for all of us to realize that we are being led down a path of disinformation, misinformation to control us to um, control you, control every single person into thinking that the air is dangerous, other people are dangerous, and that is breaking the fabric of humanity and breaking the fabric of our own trust and our own immune systems and our own ability to heal ourselves and that, that God is giving us is the goal because when people are left alone and terrified, they will turn to someone to save them. And the recommended savior today is the government. Well, it reminds me of uh, the concept of uh, a moiser, that they, uh, moiser means, for those who are not Jewish, it means basically an informer. There are commercials now all over the place uh, telling people to inform on their neighbors. There were politicians advocating this. Yeah, oh, uh, unfortunately, it's tragic. And, you know, this is, a, you use the Jewish term, moiser, of a, a snitch of an informer uh, considered the lowest form of person, the lowest level of a person as a person as an informer. And that's, that is actually universally, a uh, universally held position throughout huma uh, humanity, a view, universally held view throughout humanity is that the person who is the snitch to the authority is always the lowest person. And the, the tragedy is that twofold for the informer. 
the governors and the police officers who get the information from the informers, they hate the informers. They look at the informers as the lowest level of, of people that they, they'll give them a pat on the back and throw them a little prize because they want that, that helps the police officer or the governor do his job. But the person who's done the squealing walks around thinking that they are like somehow a hero. They are not a hero in anybody's eyes, not in the eyes of the people that they betrayed and not in the eyes of the people that they uh, helped institute tyranny. They are so hated by those governors. Anyone who's thinking of calling the governor or the police chief to report on people having family gatherings, you're gonna call 911 to say someone's having a Thanksgiving gathering or a Hanukkah gathering. They, the people in the 911 call, they think that this person is despicable. And everyone knows that, and everyone hates that person because they're low lives for doing that. They're low lives for buying into the lie that, that they're going to save lives by turning on their neighbors and disrupting people's weddings, disrupting people's family gatherings. It's the lowest form and, and, of, of humanity, and it really needs to be called out as such. An a, a, a informer, a maestro, as they call it, and the, the, that's that's really key. Number two is they have to realize that. When the communists take over any country, the people that they, they execute first is the people that help them get into power. These yeah. people have just put themselves at the top of the list. The police officer who enforces these rules and the, and the person who's the informer, they are at the top of the list. They get eliminated before the people that are refusing to follow orders. People who refuse to follow orders, the government leaves them for a while because they're just busy with the people who are complying. But the people, when the communists come into power, they hate the, the soggy-minded people who were s silly enough to actually believe the propaganda, to think that they were doing something good for the people and good for the country. They have to be eliminated at the first. You know why? Because they are so soggy-minded. They don't understand what they were supporting. And then, therefore, they will be an impediment to the tyranny as it tries to take more and more control. So they have to be eliminated because they're an obstacle to the, to the revolution. They're an obstacle to the tyranny. And that's what these sad, sad, sad these people, they're, they're really innocently thinking that they're really saving lives by making phone calls, but they're really putting their families and their lives in danger because they're, they're identifying themselves as the people that no one likes. The government doesn't like it. And the revolutionaries don't like them. Right. Out of curiosity, were you always the way you are now, or are you a Baltruva, or were you always a thinker, even as a young man? Not that you're old, but when you were a young man, or did you have some kind of a uh, uh, epiphany that woke you up? Well, first of all, I, I think that think, while well, thinking is useful, we have to recognize that more important than thinking is listening to God's wisdom that speaks in each one of us. And that's, it's not about thinking this stuff because there's a lot of people who think a lot that get themselves way off track. Um, I grew up in a modern Orthodox family, a family that uh, really believed in truth and, and really kept it simple. My father, uh, Oliver Shalom, he always emphasized the, the very, very tremendous simplicity of Abraham, Abraham's understanding of the oneness of God, that there was nothing besides God. And he emphasized the simplicity of it in every possibility, emphasized the simplicity of the message of Torah. That is such a simple message of truth and such a simple message of, of the absolute oneness of God that there's nothing besides God. Once you grasp that and then you, could, you just see it around you and then you just live according to that and you make your decisions based on that, then that's, that's, that's a life of, of connection to God. So that's what I grew up with. Um, and then at, when I went to college, I, I lived in the Chabad house there. And um, then I became you know, more... Uh, more connected to the Chabad teachings and so forth, because I saw the Lubavitcher Rebbe as the proponent of the very simplicity that my father had taught me, the, the, the simplicity, the honesty, the rigorous honesty to say what was true, no matter what. I, I believe that the Lubavitcher Rebbe, every time he said, spoke at a, at a Fabring or spoke at a talk, he was willing to have every single one of his Hasidim, every single one of his followers leave him because he was not there to create a following. He was there to spread the message of truth. And if they didn't like the truth, they could go hike somewhere else and, and find someone else to, to please their, their uh, whatever they were trying to get out of being you know, in his presence. And that's what he kept saying. He kept saying the truth, the truth, the truth, the truth. And, and that, that I saw as something that was really um, very, very inspiring. Inspiring a person who lives on that level of, of that level of commitment to truth. And um, 
So that's uh, that's why he became my teacher and, and an example I, I strive to follow. Well, I, I want to thank you very much for taking the stand that you do, uh, not only as a Jew, but I'm sure there's plenty of Gentiles that would have great admiration for you over what you're doing and for what you're doing. And I hope that we can stay in touch. I thank you very much for sharing your valuable time and making so many great points. And uh, may the God of Abraham bless you eternally and your family. Well, the same to you, uh, Mr. Unger. And I also want to mention, you know, in terms of, and I appreciate the appreciation and, and it, you know, Appreciation is the fundamental, gratitude is the fundamental of our relationships with each other and our appreciation of everything that God gives us. At the same time, my goal is to encourage every single person watching this and every person that the people watching this can reach is to move out of this uh, state of dismissing people as beyond uh, help, beyond redemption. You know, they're the this, they're the left, the Democrats, the Republicans, the this, the that, whatever way people categorize, label, and dehumanize people. And moving into seeing every human being is worth saving. And then every single person who will speak up, take what I'm bringing here, but also add in your own personal, there's a lot of information that uh, is available that you can learn. There's everyone has a unique way of speaking and reaching people. And the God, job, God is creating 8 billion of us because he wants us, each one to make our contribution to liberty and bring every human being to the recognition that we live in the world of the God of abundance. And I just wanna encourage everybody not to turn off this after the finish and say, well, you know, Rabbi Smith did such a great job. I can't wait to see the next thing he has to say. Uh, then I'm not really doing my job. My job is to provide an example and an inspiration that you, the person watching it, are going to say, wow, I could do that too. You're gonna to turn off this YouTube video or wherever you're gonna see this, you're gonna turn it off and you're gonna get out there and you're gonna to go to your neighbor's doors and say, hey, I have something to tell you. I have a message of hope to share with you and I wanna bring that to you and say it in your own words, say it with your own inspiration and that's what's truly gonna bring the, the liberty of all of humanity. Hopefully bring Mashiach while we're at it. Amen, that's, that's what the liberty of all of humanity is. It's, that's the messianic redemption for all of humanity. Exactly. Well, you're, you're certainly uh, doing that part, your part to accomplish that. And uh, once again, I thank you very much. And I'm sure we will work together in the future. And uh, I very much enjoyed listening to you and greatly admire you. And believe me, anyone who knows me will tell you, I don't give false compliments. I, I don't give them out to too many people. <laughs> so uh, God bless you. God bless you too. All Thank right. you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.